church. Amen. Well, it's great to be oh, here this morning. I've got my incredible assistants to assist oh, me to no have something to It's just really heavy. I'm really sore. Yeah, it's really wow. heavy. Carrying this around all day yesterday, it was just, it was a lot. And uh, for those that are wondering, what in the world is this thing? Yeah, what is it? It's the trophy for our annual it's turkey bowl. Yeah. Okay. It's not where we eat turkey, it's where we play football right around Thanksgiving. Uh -oh. And so every year we host a flag football tournament. We divide it into different teams. It's a great, great time. And we have a, a, a different champion every year. We have a lot of fun. And fortunately, our team got to win this year. Yeah. And what's awesome is we are now the two time oh. defending champions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it was it was great being together. Uh, we've got three teams right now every year when we compete. We've got the Savages, yeah. the Black Panthers, yeah. and then we've got the Weekend Warriors. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the team I was able to be a part of there. We had disciples both from, from Dallas, Fort Worth, and we had disciples all the way from Houston. Come on. They wanted to get in on the action. It was an awesome time. Now, our team, uh, we had our dear brother Keenan. Come on, Keenan. We had Lala Come on. and Tarika. Come on. From Houston, we had uh, our dear brother Samaj, Adele, and Mark. As well, we had Bob. Come on. Come on. We had Jose. Yeah. We had Pedro. Yeah. And we even had Mariana. She was on our team. Yeah. Yeah. did a great job. You know, uh, the final game was intense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we lost against the Savages in the first game. Come on, Jerry. Uh, and we were able to be victorious against the Black Panthers in the second game. They played, and then we played the winner of that for the championship, uh, which was the Savages. And after we, we won, we, we got the trophy, right? And, and uh, I've been blessed to be able to be part of, of different teams that have won uh, different championships. <laughs> but the older uh -huh. you get, the more the championships mean to you. Come on. <laughs> and although all it was was we had these little dangling flags on our hips and people would pull them, and we're just running between cones on a field, I remember when we won the championship, I had to fight back tears. Oh. Come on. <laughs> because Talk about the it, bro. level of effort that it took to win yeah. that championship. <laughs> Compared to other championships I'd won when I was younger, I was like, wow, I barely have anything left. <laughs> this means so much. Now, between uh, uh, winning the championship and another award that they have, is the most valuable player. Come on, come on, bro. And so we, we got done, uh, we're all ah, we're excited, and so they hand the trophy to the MVP, and they said that this year's MVP is Tyler Sears. <laughs> 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 so they're like, oh, you know, jumping around, MVP, MVP. And I was just fighting back more tears. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> I can barely move. <laughs> I am completely exhausted <laughs> and uh, I felt very graced and grateful but really guys it, it was a team victory come on um, if I'm if, if I'm to, to give any award out, it's really for the team we, we did such a great job yeah. the teamwork the camaraderie and so if, if I'm not quote unquote the MVP then who or what is the real MVP come on, come on. And that's the title of our lesson this morning. Come on, come on. The real MVP. What does that mean? The most valuable player. Come on, bro. It's the individual or individuals at times that produce the most and give the most in order for the team to be successful. And this morning, I believe we all understand who the real MVP is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And that if we're going to learn and desire to be the most valuable person that we can be for Christ, the most valuable player that we can be for Jesus and his kingdom, then we're going to look at a few attributes of how Jesus was the real MVP. Look over in John chapter 14. Come on, bro. No, I'm not going to lie, that little ramp there and, and moving my arms, I, I started to cramp up in my neck. I just to, <laughs> to be honest here. Come on, bro. The real MVP. I believe the first attribute that we as disciples need to learn and glean from the scriptures to be more like Jesus 
in this way is our first point. It's teamwork over talent. Come on. Come on. Teamwork wow. over talent. Yeah. In John chapter 14, down in verse 11, the Bible says something incredible here. This is Jesus speaking. He says, believe me when I say it. Is that how we are this morning? Come on. When Jesus says something, we believe it. Amen. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Yeah. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Wow. Because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The real MVP, Jesus tells us right here, teamwork over talent. You see, we've got to believe for us that Jesus says something that we've got to think about. He says, listen, when you're with me, you together are going to do even greater things. Okay, guys. Let's think about what Jesus did here for a moment. And Jesus says, you're going to do what I've done. But it's not going to stop there. He says, you're going to do even greater things. And Jesus says, believe me when I say this. And we've got to believe Jesus. Jesus is not a liar. Nope. So if Jesus says we're going to do even greater things, what does that mean? Remember, Jesus fed people. He healed people. He saved souls. Yeah. In fact, his message, his love, his example resonated and reached the whole world, and it still reaches the world today. Yeah. What we're trying to do, if we're honest, has not been done for 2,000 years. The men and women which followed Jesus took the gospel to the ends of the earth. And since that time, God has been searching for people. God has been looking for a movement. God has been looking for men and women who are not talented enough, but have the teamwork, who have the unity and the faith that believe in what Jesus says, that we, in fact, are going to evangelize the world in our lifetimes. Is that not intense to think about? That's what God's dream is. That's what God's desire is is Amen. you know coca-cola has evangelized the world yeah. everywhere i've flown i've seen coca-cola yeah. everywhere i've gone i've eaten mcdonald's yeah. Come on. everywhere i've gone someone's wearing nike yeah. Yeah. and everywhere you go your you know creme brulee latte at yeah. starbucks oh, yeah. <laughs> tastes exactly the same yeah for us we've got to believe it's time for god's true message to reach the world. Yeah. Yep. To not just think about it, to talk about it, but to have the mindset that our teamwork is going to get the job done. Our desire to ask Jesus, this is what we want. We don't ask Jesus for Lamborghinis. We don't ask Jesus for three-story houses. We don't ask Jesus for, we ask to do his will. Yeah. Jesus, we want to do your will. We want to raise the trophy. Yeah. We want to get it done. Come on. It's interesting that, that Jesus says this. You're going to do even greater things. And I believe that he, he learned it from, from another example. And it's like, look over in John chapter 3. Come on. Come on. Come on, Tyler. Come on, Tyler. Jesus says, listen, I'm doing great things. But you're going to do even greater and even better. Jesus' heart is for you to do better. Yeah. yeah. Wow. For you to do greater. And let's look at this example of John the Baptist. John chapter 3, down to verse 28. John the Baptist is questioned. He says, people ask him, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? Are you the great one? Are you the real MVP? And in verse 28, he says, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah. I'm not the real MVP. But I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become 
less. John the Baptist, speaking about Jesus, says, listen, this is one we've been waiting for. And it's not my time to shine in. I'm not the real MVP. Jesus Christ is. And in order for Jesus to become who he must become, for him to become greater, I must become less. You know, who's the real MVP in our lives today? Is it you? Or is it Jesus? If Jesus is in fact going to take that role, then you must become less so that Jesus can become greater. And the irony itself is Jesus kind of just keeping the circle going. He's like, okay, you become less so Jesus can become greater. I'm going to become less so you can do even greater things. And we've got to believe Jesus at his word when he calls us here. He says, when you work together, when you believe this, when you all make yourselves less, then that's when the real victory is won. Who is that real MVP? Not only that, is your heart to make everyone else an MVP? Because many times we go, oh yeah, call my number. Woof, that's right. I need to get the ball this play. I'm going to score. I'm going to win. I'm going to get the trophy. I'm gonna... And it becomes all about ourselves. Yet John the Baptist says, no, no, no. I'm going to become less. Jesus says, I'm going to make myself nothing. And we're to imitate that. That in our Bible talks is that our mindset. That we want to be a real MVP. We want to make ourselves less so the Bible talk can become better. Yeah. That in our ministries, in our households, in our families, in our marriages, to become the real MVP is to have the teamwork which will make the dream Come on. work. We've got to be united with Jesus. We've got to work together with Jesus. We've got to work together with one another. We've got to work together with what we have around the world. Amen. To think about what God is doing from what we saw in the video awesome. about the South Asian Missions Conference. Yeah. Yeah. 7,000 disciples go, wow. Yeah. 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 But that's a drop in the bucket. Yeah. Yeah. That's like 0.001%. Zero 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 one percent of the world's population. And we need to be inspired, but Jesus says you're going to do even greater things. You know, I want to challenge us here quickly. Don't just be the MVP. Be the real MVP. Come on. Make everywhere you go and everyone you know better by becoming less. Come on. I think a lot of times we, we want to blame our, our lack of skill or talent yeah. as an excuse for not doing our best. But, well, I didn't graduate college, or I barely graduated, or I didn't do this, or I'm not as smart as so-and-so. <laughs> Whatever excuse you want to come up with for what we see or perceive as a quote-unquote lack of talent. But there's things that don't take talent totally. yeah. that we can all be successful in. Yeah. Come on. Being on time. Yeah. Come on. Doesn't take talent. Nope. No. And I really want to challenge the church here. Many of us were constantly late. Yeah. We're late for Bible talk. Yeah. We're late for church. We're late for our meetings. We're late for the things that we were committed to. And it shows that we just don't care as much as we need to. Come on. And so we deceive ourselves because we're like, wow, you know, I'm just I'm not good at being on time. It's, it's not my talent. It's not an issue of talent. Yeah. Nope. Okay. It's an issue of all hearts. Yeah. Because you're on time for whatever you want to do. Come on. Yeah. If your favorite, you know, musician or sports team says, hey, we want you to come, but you gotta be there at 3 a.m. Yeah. You're getting there at 2 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. And you're making sure, like, whatever it takes. Yeah. Yeah. And so perhaps we've forgotten who the real MVP is. Yeah. We've forgotten it. if you had a chance to re- meet the real MVP, Jesus himself. Wow. What would you do? Yeah. And I put before you, every time we come together to worship, Jesus is here. Yeah. Jesus is with us. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got to show him every day and every opportunity yeah. to make ourselves less so he can become more so the world can be one. Work ethic come on. does not take talent. Yeah. Yeah. Effort and serving does not take talent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Attitude, energy, zeal, passion. You know, when we sing songs, you don't need to have a great voice. You just need to make a joyful noise. Yeah. 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 But if I'm honest, many of us, we don't sing. 
Oh. Mm. What do you think we're going to do in heaven? Oh. You think we're going to play Xbox in heaven? Oh. <laughs> you think we're going to drink lattes in heaven? Oh. Right? You know what I'm saying? You think we're going to hang out at the Mac in heaven? Come on. <laughs> Literally, heaven is us worshiping our Father. Yeah. yeah. Just like we get done with, with one song, right, turn to Psalm 103 and you're yes. <laughs> We've sang this one like infinite times. Come on. Yeah. And we're going to sing it infinite more times for all of eternity. Yeah. Yeah. If our heart isn't to come here to worship the same songs, then, then perhaps our hearts become hardened. Yeah. The Bible says make a joyful noise. It doesn't have to be a precise noise. Right. Yeah. But a joyful one. And when we don't sing, it's because we lack a joy and a passion and right. a gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. Because when you're excited about something, you just want to sing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right? Yeah. Walking around the house, you just found you just looked at your bank account and you got paid. <laughs> <laughs> right? We're playing uh, 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 the the football tournament there, oh, and there was there was pass interference. <laughs> and and so the initials for that is PI. Yeah. And someone goes, P.I., is that uh, 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 potential interest? We're happy, we're excited, we sing, we just want to, we don't even, we're just we're super off key, it doesn't even matter, we just want to sing. Yeah. 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 And so when we come here to church and we don't sing, it's because we're just not excited about yeah. what God is doing in our life. Come on. Yeah. We got to repent of that. Teachability. Yeah. Having a heart to learn doesn't take talents. Going the extra mile does not take talents. Making sure we're prepared does not take talent. And lastly, what we're talking about, teamwork does not take talent. Look over in Acts chapter 4. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. He's good, bro. Come on. We're about to jump around here a little bit because I really want us to see that no matter where you're at, some of us, we do have talent and we've got to use it for God. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. others of us, when we feel like we're not, which is a lie, you totally are talented. Yeah. Yeah. When you don't feel talented, it doesn't become an excuse. Right. Because teamwork is more important than our talents and skills and abilities. Mm -hmm. Verse 13, chapter 4. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were scholarly, talented, handsome, extraordinary, uh, unprecedented, uh, one of a kind. I don't think that version is there. That's the wrong version. I think that's the The new prideful version, amen. Oh. <laughs> it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Yeah, amen. It doesn't take talent to be a disciple. Amen. The Bible says they were, they were unschooled and ordinary. Many of us already know the Greek for unschooled and ordinary is idiotas. Yeah. That's what it says. Yeah. And so the Bible says right here they were unschooled and ordinary, yet what was profound about them? It wasn't their bank account. What was profound wasn't their height. It wasn't their GPA. It wasn't their, their status linked in. Yeah. The Bible says it was their courage. And it says because here they had spent time with Jesus. How can unschooled ordinary men and women do even greater things than Jesus? Look over in Acts chapter 2. Come on. Come on, bro. Verse 41. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Whoa. Jesus never did that. Wow. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Jesus never did that. Look over in Acts chapter 4. Come on. Come on, bro. Come on Dave. Verse 4, it says, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Remember they fed 5,000? Wow. There wasn't just a, a, a physical feeding, now it's a spiritual one. 5,000 are now in God's church. Chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Chapter 6, verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was 
increasing. Verse 7, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. We, guys, in a matter of six verses, you can go just from increasing to increasing rapidly. Wow. <laughs> Look over in chapter, chapter 12. Wow. I don't have time to go through all of them. Yeah. I don't think my legs can hold up that Come long. on, bro. <laughs> Come on, bro. <laughs> the Bible says in verse 24, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. What does this mean? It means that not only is there a numerical growth that is happening in God's movement, but there's a geographical spread of where it's going. See, if, if we're not in a church that is not only growing, but wanting to spread, if we're not part of a movement that isn't just growing, but spreading, then it's not living out what the scriptures desire. God's message is to spread and to Come on. And that's living out being a real MVP for Jesus Christ. But what does it take? It just means you gotta be unschooled. You just gotta be ordinary. And you just gotta spend time with Jesus. Why? Because teamwork over talent will make you the real MVP every single time. Look over in Colossians chapter one. Let's see the ultimate product of these unschooled and ordinary men and women. Colossians chapter 1, down to verse 21. The Bible says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by cross physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, and free from accusation. Good little two-letter word right here in verse 23. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have became a servant. The Bible says right here that our brothers and sisters in the first century didn't just reach the corner of where their quote-unquote church was. Didn't just reach the community of where the church was. Didn't reach just the city, the state, or the nation. Literally the whole wow. world. And we want to be a church. We want to be a people. We want to be a movement yeah. that genuinely is going to go after this in our lifetime. Yeah. You only got one. Okay, well, I'll get it a second time around. I'll get it in my next life. We've got to get the job done. Yeah. And it's going to take all of us becoming a real MVP. Us becoming less. So that Jesus can become more. And that when Jesus becomes more, he says you're going to do even greater things than I am. And we do even greater things by making ourselves less so that Jesus can become more. <laughs> you know, we're doing the same things today. Yeah. I look at what God is, is doing over in India and it's incredible. Yep. The church uh, started there in Chennai with a dear brother and sister, Raja and Debs Rajan, who took a stand with just them and 20 other men and women. And they said, you know what? We're going to reach a nation of over 1.2 billion people. Ooh. They grew the church in just a couple years to over 100 and realized, you know what? 100 is not going to get the job done. We need to send out more teams, more churches. They send out the church planning the Bangalore. The church planning over to Kathmandu. And just last year, God sent out through them the church in New Delhi. Come on. And now the church in New Delhi is over 200 disciples. Wow. They had the uh, South Asian Missions Conference. We got to see the video there. What wasn't talked about is the fact that they closed out the conference this morning with 32 baptisms. Wow. Wow. Come on. Many of them are just ordinary, but all of them spending time with Jesus. Wow. Amen. Amen. Teamwork over talent. Amen. Every time, our second point frequent forgiveness. Amen. To be the real MVP, it's going to take frequent forgiveness. Look over in Luke chapter 17. And Luke chapter 17, in verse 3. The Bible says, so watch yourselves. 
If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day. Amen, teens? Seven times in a day. Amen, roommates? Seven times in a day. Amen, marrieds? Seven times in a day. And seven times come back to you saying, I repent. You must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> Frequent forgiveness. You know, here we see, when someone sins against us, we've got to take it to them first. And the Bible says, at times, and even right here directly, rebuke them. I think many times when we see disciples fall short, we're fearful to rebuke them. Jesus' letter says, hey, listen, did they sin? Go rebuke them. That's what it says. To rebuke is not so you feel better. No. To rebuke is so that they'll change and repent. Yeah. Yep. That's what it's for. But a lot of us were like, ooh, baby, I'm ready to rebuke. I've got a few things in my chest that i got to get off of it. Okay, then, then you're the one that needs to be rebuked. Because <laughs> you've got sin. You've sinned against them. But the Bible says here, you've got to fight to be reconciled. Yeah, Mom. And I think many of us, we come into God's kingdom and we don't have these skills and abilities. I didn't. Yeah. Interpersonal skills to talk about what I'm really thinking and feeling. Yeah. To not be passive aggressive. Right. To believe that we're going to come to resolution instead of just kind of having like an awkward distance until we forget about it and maybe come back together. <laughs> no, too many of us, we got to learn how to deal with conflict. Mm -hmm. We need to go to that person with the heart to reconcile. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's that going to take? Faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. To have true faith is to assume the best of the brother or sister that's hurt you. And many times, because we're hurt, we assume the worst. It's like, you absolutely did that on purpose. You knew exactly what you were trying to do. You knew, and in fact, Jesus on the cross itself says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I'm like, Jesus, they absolutely knew what they were doing. They were trying to kill you. And he goes, if they understood the true ramifications of their decisions, they would never do it. Forgive them. And our heart must be like Jesus. That six, seven, it doesn't matter in one day itself. If we want to repent, God will forgive us. And if others want to repent of the ways they hurt, the Bible says, we must forgive them. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you. That's frequent forgiveness. Yep. One of the things that can happen is we didn't sin against someone but we can feel like someone has something against us. Like, I feel good, but you're just acting like a weirdo right now. Like, must something happen, but you know what? Whatever, you're going to go through it, deal with it, whatever, when you're ready to, to figure it out and talk about it. Okay. No. Well, if they have the problem, then they need to bring it to me, right? Let's see the Bible says. Look over in Matthew, chapter 5. Come on. See, this is where teamwork comes in. Yeah. Yeah. And when we have true teamwork and the dream works, yeah. it's because we have frequent forgiveness. Matthew chapter 5, down to verse 23. The Bible says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Wow. The Bible says right here that the standard of reconciliation is not just talking to others when we feel sinned against, but making sure there's unity in every relationship. You got that little kind of like, I just kind of feel a little distant. Mm -hmm. Just kind of felt like that hug wasn't quite the normal hug. Yeah. Wow. Just kind of felt like, you know, I said something and your eyes just kind of wandered a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fine, whatever. <laughs> but the Bible says here, when you're, when you're going to give a gift to God, when you're going you're gonna to be close to Him and you want to be close and reconciled, you've got to think, am I right in every relationship? What? And is every relationship right with me? Mm -hmm. 
about? Is there brothers and sisters? Yes, I've got reconciled. But I just feel like maybe they're not reconciled with me. The Bible says drop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. And go and be reconciled. And I think for us, a lot of times, when seeking forgiveness, we need to be able to hear and say several things. You know, once upon a time, my, my family came from the Hawaiian Islands. And we had this incredible tradition called Ho'oponopono. Ho'oponopono. Amen? Amen. And even in the world, they desire reconciliation. Even outside of Christ, they desire to bring people together. And Ho'oponopono is simply when there's sin amongst two parties, they come together and they actually bring a pile of rocks. And the rocks represent all the things that they're feeling towards that person. Wow. And they each get a chance to say what they feel, and they let go of the rock. Wow. Little by little, wow. until they're each gone. Until every stone wow. is removed. Wow. And during that time, they say four <clears throat> simple phrases. <clears throat> Number one, they say, I'm sorry. Number two, please forgive me. Number three, thank you. And lastly, I love you. Wow. That's awesome. You see, for us, many times we go to somebody and go, I feel hurt by you. And our response is, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> or we say we're feeling, and we expect the person to forgive us, even though we haven't apologized for what we've done to hurt them. <laughs> and in our marriages, we're just too prideful to love our spouse, to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for hurting you. And our roommates and our lives, we're just too prideful. We're just unwilling to be like Jesus. Even islanders who bury pigs in the ground and sing songs about, you know, you know, the island and the ocean. They can say, I'm sorry. They can say, please forgive me. They can say thank you and you're welcome. Amen. <laughs> Come on. Come on. And I love you. How much more so disciples? Come on. If there's anyone you have something against, or you feel like someone has something against you, I want to challenge you. You go to them today and put forgiveness in to practice. Come on. What does frequent forgiveness do? Look over in Psalm 133. Come on, Tyler. Fre frequent forgiveness. Fortifies family. Frequent forgiveness fortifies family. Psalm 133. In verse 1, it says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Amen? Amen. It is like precious oil. Pour it on the head. Running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the, the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. The Bible says right here that when we're unified, when we're reconciled, it's like oil being poured on someone who's rocking a beard. Amen. Come on. Man. It's like we brought our brother Robert up here. <laughs> and we pour oil on him, not pencil Come on. oil. <laughs> but olive oil. Yeah. It represents God's blessing. Yeah. It's the anointing which was given to God's chosen. Yeah. And he says, listen, when you're unified, when you're reconciled, God's like, I'm just going to pour oil over you and you are anointed. Yeah. You are set apart. My blessing is on you. You. He says it's like dew on the mountain, the original mountain dew. <laughs> and dew because oftentimes in these arid places wouldn't receive rain. So the only moisture they would get was from the dew which would be created in the morning and it would then fall into the soil itself and it would help the plants to survive, to grow and mature. And he says, your life, your love, is to be like that new every morning. Your love and the forgiveness which you get from God is new every morning. Therefore, you've got to do the do and make it new 
Mm -hmm. And put that in people's lives, the forgiveness that's there, as it seeps down into their hearts, and it raises up to grow and mature God's church, God's people, to be what he desires it to be. Are you with me, church? Amen. You know, during the flag football tournament, there are a lot of mistakes being made. Mm. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> no one plays a perfect game. We all make mistakes. And that for us, frequent forgiveness was needed. I'd make a bad play, and when I'd come on the sidelines, I'd look at my teammates and go, guys, I'm so sorry. It's my bad. But you know what they did? They go, it's okay, bro. We're going to get it next time. Yeah. <laughs> and when somebody else make a mistake, they come, Tyler, I'm so sorry, bro. It's going to be great. Sis, it's going to be great. We're going to get it next time. And there was a forgiveness, and it was frequent. We had to like talk the whole game. I'm so sorry. I'm just gonna <laughs> Rocks are being thrown everywhere. But there's a lot that had to go on. I think a lot of times what happens over time, if we don't practice this to ask for forgiveness, if we don't seek to be reconciled, my bad turns to I'm bad. Or my bad turns to your bad. And there's no longer forgiveness that's there. No one who makes a mistake. I've never seen a game, professional game, where the player goes, I'm bad, and just quits. <laughs> no, you make a mistake, you get back on the other side, and you work even yeah. harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That when we fall short, the grace that's in our life from Jesus Christ is to motivate us so that we can have that new do, that new anointing every single day. Yeah. You see, lastly, family isn't fortified only through forgiveness of one another, but by the forgiveness of others, mm -hmm. others being saved. You know, family isn't fortified in this, in this way. See, I want to challenge us to be a family that saves. Yeah. Because when you see others being saved, it fortifies your family. Oh, yeah. When you yeah. see the family growing, it reminds me, Ryan, reminds me why you do what you do. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to challenge all of our Bible talks. To fight to be fortified. Yeah. To fight to be fruitful by the end of the year. Amen. Yeah. Why? Because there's nothing like seeing a soul being saved that brings the family together. Yeah. Our last point, an unstoppable determination. Wow. Let's see our last attribute of Jesus here in Luke <laughs> chapter 13. Come on, Tyler. Great stuff, bro. Luke chapter 13. Remember for us, the real MVP, teamwork over talent. We also need frequent forgiveness. Yeah. And lastly, an unstoppable determination. Luke 13, verse 31. It says, at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox. I'll keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. Ooh. In any case, I must press on today. And I must press on tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Wow. I don't know about you. But right here we find Jesus with an unstoppable determination. Not even death it was going to stop him from reaching his goal. And his response is quite fascinating. He didn't say, hey, go tell that knucklehead. He says, you go tell that fox. I'll keep on driving demons and healing people. You know, well, why would Jesus reference a fox? Yeah. I've never I thought about this. I read it and I was like, wait, wait. I always read it and I thought that was cool, but why, why there? Foxes are mentioned six times in the Bible, and none of them are good. But let's look at one of the few examples of a fox. Dare we say, let's see what the fox says, amen? Come on. We're going to go to what we call the taboo book this morning, amen? We're going to the Song of Songs. It's a book, guys, look at it. Song of Songs, chapter 2. Some of you guys are like, what? wait, where is that? It's not from the No, it's not from the I mean, who says by from the You have to ask 
Yeah. Yeah. Song of Songs, chapter two. The real MVP. Keep repeating yes, a few things here so that you get a chance to find it. Come on. Come on. The Bible says in verse 15, Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes, that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. You see here the Bible's talking about love. And it's talking about a relationship. And he says, in our relationship, we've got to catch the foxes. Yep. Yeah. The little ones. They don't just get into the vineyards. They ruin it. They ruin the relationships. They ruin the goals. They ruin the dreams. Yeah. Foxes are fascinating creatures. They very much have a love-hate relationship. I don't know about you. I love foxes. They're like the cutest little creature you've ever seen. I lived in London. Oh, yeah. And there were foxes that would run around. Oh. And like my dream is I would like walk down the, the hill back to where I live every night. And I really hope to see this fox. And I'd see him, you know, and I'd get really close to him. And oh, come on, buddy. I'd almost get to touch him and then he'd take him. Oh, man, come so on, cute. Man. Come on, man. See, we love how they look but we hate what they cause. Yeah. They're so destructive. They get into people's homes and they destroy the, the attic and the insulation. They go and they chew things up so they can get it. And all of a sudden what was so cute, what was so innocent, becomes so destructive. And many times in our relationships, right? Somebody does something, that comes, that's kind of cute. I'll, I'll talk to you. <laughs> and then over time you're like if they do this one more time I'm going to lose it. it's not cute anymore it's not funny anymore it's not, you know, and this is how we get in our relationships and that's what it means with these little foxes and so the foxes stop the unity the foxes stop our ability to get what God desires done see unstoppable Determination kills complacency. Mm -hmm. The foxes are cute, but they stop us from doing what we want. Mm -hmm. This individual says, Jesus, stop. Herod wants to kill you. Herod wants to get in the way. Herod wants you just to settle for less. Mm -hmm. Just to settle, just in compromise a little bit. I mean, Jesus, you can like still get a lot done. And Jesus realized his goal was to die. Wow. It's like, you know, it'd be nice to not have to die. Yeah. You know, it'd be, be nice. I'm 33. It'd be nice to, you know, get married, have a family. You know, I'm really trying to, 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 to spread my, my carpentry business. <laughs> I'm really trying to work on, you know, raising these guys up. I mean, that's a good point. What if I just had some more time here? Yeah. All the things I'd like to do. And we become complacent. Wow. And Jesus could have done that, but he said, no, no, no. Get that fox out of here. Yeah. It's cute what you've been doing. It's cute what you desire. But enough is enough. I'm going to reach my goal. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Without an unstoppable determination, you'll never be victorious. Mm -hmm. See, you can be united with no goal. You can even be forgiving of one another. But the purpose of being united the purpose of being forgiven is not so you can be complacent, but so you can reach the goal and dare we say, and dying to ourselves, yeah. we can see more done for Christ. Yes, I, I believe all the football teams were united. Yeah. 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 And I heard them all when, when times got hard. They're like, bro, sis, it's okay. Great job. High fives. Even sportsmanship amongst one another. High fives. Like, Woo, great job. But what was the difference? Come on. I believe it wasn't that they were not determined, because they were. Yeah. I believe that our team was simply more determined. Mm -hmm. And there was an unstoppable determination which helped us to win the prize. Well, well, how do you get that? Well, how did Jesus do it? He set goals. Mm -hmm. He set goals. In, in football, how do you win the game? You don't just like magically win it. It's a game that's won literally by inches. Mm -hmm. And we've got to set inch goals and game goals. Mm -hmm. 
what is that? That's short term and long term. A lot of times you're like, one day I want to, this is a fun one here, get married, amen? Yeah. Amen. And I'll yeah. never forget a story my wife told me about what it takes. She was a young Christian, and she was, uh, you know, in a time with, with the sister that was leading her. And the sister asked her, Shay, what are you looking for in a brother? Oh. <laughs> wow. <Well. laughs> <laughs> she verbatim just, dis- no, it's good. <laughs> I want a brother who's like spiritual. And he's righteous. He's pure. He's driven. I w- and just went on to express this infinite list of the most extraordinary <laughs> brother you could ever imagine. I mean, the sisters you hear preach. <laughs> she, she goes for it. <laughs> so she described this amazing brother, and the sister was like, wow, that sounds like an amazing man right there. I know, I can't wait. <laughs> well, well she, let, let me ask you. What kind of sister do you think that kind of brother is looking for? Wow. Hmm. <laughs> Let's start with her. Yeah. And I think many times, as disciples, we want the big dream. I want the wife that's going to be like this and it's going to do that. I want the husband that's going to be here and go there. I want the ministry and the job and the life. But we're not willing to say, okay, what do I need to do? to be able to get there, right. yeah. Come on. to have those short-term goals yeah. in our life. Yeah. Yeah. Mine. The game of life is not just simply won by being in the game itself. Wow. It's one inch by inch, going for the first down, every touchdown, every quarter, every half, every injury, every substitute, every change, whatever it is in life, We've got to be those that desire to dream big and to have great goals for Christ. It's time to look back and look forward. What did you desire to achieve for God, but you didn't make it yet? See, sometimes you've got to look back and also remember what God has brought you through. And secondly, you've got to look forward. What do you want to see happen in your life? personally, in your ministry, in your life physically and spiritually. And you know, I believe for all of us, we've got to have an unstoppable determination. And when I think of that, I think about our, our soon-to-be sister, Bree. Come on, Bree. Come on, Bree. Yeah. She's been studying the Bible here at UT Arlington. Yeah. Come on. And she started studying the Bible and began wrestling with the scriptures like, wow, oh, this is hard. Mm-hmm. And like she, she shared, even at times of good news sharing, she's like, I just don't know if I'm ready yet to really go for it. Pray for me. Mm-hmm. So we all pray. God, help her to have an unstoppable determination. Well, I think she's got that. Yep. Yesterday they got, got together and said, hey, we're, we're thinking about, uh, you know, maybe tomorrow you could get baptized. Mm-hmm. What's that going to take? Three Bible studies. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. And yesterday... She did persecution. Come on, man. She did the church. Yeah. And she counted the cost. She said, it's unstoppable. I'm going to get baptized tomorrow. And today, she's going to get baptized. We all start in the Bible. Get an unstoppable determination to get right with God. Yeah. And disciples, get an unstoppable determination to kill the complacency in your life that's stopping you from being who God called you to be. Get rid of the foxes. Who cares what they say? It's about what Jesus says. Amen? Amen. This morning, let's fight to get the ultimate prize. Not a trophy (laughs) with a turkey football hybrid. (laughs) Although it's awesome to win. Not one where you simply become an MVP of a church league. But let us be those who give our blood, our sweat, and our tears to win that ultimate prize for ourselves and others. That we get everything that we're sore because of the amount we shared our food. Oh, wow. Because it's, we just want it. We're just exhausted 
from the number of times we forgave one another. <laughs> Let us give all we have to win that prize. Yeah. Yeah. Teamwork over talent. Jesus died so you could become an MVP. And let us be like our real MVP and make others better than ourselves. Let us have frequent forgiveness. To say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you as many times as it takes. And lastly, an unstoppable determination which kills complacency. Let us be today the real MVP which God desires and to God be the glory. Thank you so much.